The Prince of Preachers. Charles Haddon Spurgeon has been called England's greatest contribution to the spread of the gospel in the 19th century. One of his contemporaries said that the chief secret of Spurgeon's attractiveness was the fact that in every sermon, no matter what the text or the occasion, he explained the way of salvation in simple terms. He was a man to whom the Lord Jesus Christ was more dear than all the universe, whose boast was in the name of the Lord all the day long. Spurgeon's messages remain one of the great treasure houses of Christian literature, still bringing the light of the gospel and the comfort of the scriptures to hungry souls long after the preacher has passed into glory. This is Charles Kelsch inviting you to listen to a message from the Prince of Preachers. C.H. Spurgeon preached this message on May 27, 1855, at Exeter Hall, Strand. It is entitled, The Eternal Name. The text, Psalm 72, verse 17. His name shall endure forever. No one here requires to be told that this is the name of Jesus Christ which shall endure forever. Men have said of many of their works, they shall endure forever but how much they have been disappointed. In the age succeeding the flood, they made the brick, they gathered the slime, and when they had piled old Babel's tower, they said, This shall last forever. But God confounded their language. They finished it not. By his lightnings he destroyed it, and left it a monument of their folly. Old Pharaoh and the Egyptian monarchs heaped up their pyramids, and they said, They shall stand forever. And so indeed they do stand, but the time is approaching when age shall devour even these. So with all the proudest works of man, whether they have been his temples or his monarchies, he has written everlasting on them. But God has ordained their end, and they have passed away. The most stable things have been evanescent as shadows and the bubbles of an hour, speedily destroyed at God's bidding. Where is Nineveh, and where is Babylon? Where are the cities of Persia? Where are the high places of Edom? Where are Moab and the princes of Ammon? Where are the temples or the heroes of Greece? Where are the millions that passed from the gates of Thebes? Where are the hosts of Xerxes, or where are the vast armies of the Roman emperors? Have they not passed away? And though in their pride they said, This monarchy is an everlasting one, this queen of the seven hills shall be called the eternal city. Its pride is dimmed, and she who sat alone and said, I shall be no widow, but a queen for ever, she hath fallen, hath fallen, and in a little while she shall sink like a millstone in the flood, her name being a curse and a byword, and her sight the habitation of dragons and of owls. Man calls his works eternal, God calls them fleeting. Man conceives that they are built of rock, God says, nay, sand, or worse than that, they are air. Man says he erects them for eternity. God blows but for a moment, and where are they? Like baseless fabrics of a vision, they are past and gone forever. It is pleasant, then, to find that there is one thing which is to last forever. Concerning that one thing, we hope to speak tonight, if God will enable me to preach and you to hear. His name shall endure forever. First, the religion sanctified by his name shall endure forever. Secondly, the honor of his name shall endure forever. And thirdly, the saving, comforting power of his name shall endure forever. First, the religion of the name of Jesus is to endure forever. When impostors forged their delusions, they had hopes that peradventure they might in some distant age carry the world before them and if they saw a few followers gather around their standard who offered incense at their shrine, then they smiled and said, My religion shall outshine the stars and last through eternity. But how mistaken have they been! How many false systems have started up and passed away! Why, some of us, even in our short lifetime, have seen sects that arose like Jonah's gourd in a single night and passed away as swiftly. We, too, have beheld prophets rise, who have had their hour, yea, they have had their day, 
as dogs all have, but like the dogs, their day has passed away, and the impostor, where is he? And the arch-deceiver, where is he? Gone and ceased. Specially might I say this of the various systems of infidelity. Within a hundred and fifty years, how has the boasted power of reason changed? It is piled up one thing, and then another day it is laughed at its own handiwork, demolished its own castle, and constructed another. And the next day a third. It hath a thousand dresses. Once it came forth like a fool with its bells, heralded by Voltaire. Then it came out a braggart bully like Tom Paine. Then it changed its course and assumed another shape, till forsooth we have it in the base bestial secularism of the present day, which looks for naught but the earth, keeps its nose upon the ground, and like the beast thinks this world is enough, or looks for another through seeking this. Why, before one hair on this head shall be gray, the last secularist shall have passed away. Before many of us are fifty years of age, a new infidelity shall come, and to those who say, Where will saints be? We can turn around and say, Where are you? And they will answer, We have altered our names. They will have altered their names, assumed a fresh shape, put on a new form of evil, but still their nature will be the same, opposing Christ and endeavoring to blaspheme his truths. On all their systems of religion, or non-religion, for that is a system too, it may be written, evanescent, fading as the flower, fleeting as the meteor, frail and unreal as a vapor. But of Christ's religion it shall be said, His name shall endure forever. Let me now say a few things. Not to prove it, for that I do not wish to do, but to give you some hints whereby possibly I may one day prove it to other people that Jesus Christ's religion must inevitably endure forever. And first we ask those who think it shall pass away, when was there a time when it did not exist? We ask them whether they can point their finger to a period when the religion of Jesus was an unheard of thing. Yes, they will reply, before the days of Christ and his apostles. But we answer, Nay, Bethlehem was not the birthplace of the gospel. Though Jesus was born there, there was a gospel long before the birth of Jesus, and a preached one too, although not preached in all its simplicity and plainness as we hear it now. There was a gospel in the wilderness of Sinai, although it might be confused with the smoke of the incense and only to be seen through slaughtered victims, yet there was a gospel there. Yea, more, we take them back to the fair trees of Eden, where the fruits perpetually ripened and summer always rested, and amid these groves we tell them there was a gospel, and we let them hear the voice of God, as he spoke to recreant man and said, The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. And having taken them back thus far, we ask, Where were false religions born? Where was their cradle? They point us to Mecca, or they turn their fingers to Rome, or they speak of Confucius or the dogmas of Buddha. But we say, you only go back to a distant obscurity. We take you to the primeval age. We direct you to the days of purity. We take you back to the time when Adam first trod the earth. And then we ask you whether it is not likely that as the firstborn, it will not also be the last to die. And as it was born so early, and still exists, while a thousand ephemera have become extinct, whether it does not look most probable, that when all others shall have perished like the bubble upon the wave, this only shall swim like a good ship upon the ocean, and still shall bear its myriad souls, not to the land of shades, but across the river of death to the plains of heaven. We ask next, supposing Christ's gospel to become extinct, what religion is to supplant it? We inquire of the wise man who says Christianity is soon to die. Pray, sir, what religion are we to have in its stead? Are we to have the delusions of the heathen who bow before their gods and worship images of wood and stone? Will you have the orgies of Bacchus or the obscenities of Venus? Would you see your daughters once more bowing down before Tammuz or performing obscene rites as of old? Nay, ye would not endure such things. Ye would say, it must not be tolerated by civilized men. Then what would ye have? Would ye have Romanism and its superstition? Ye will say, no, God help us never. 
They may do what they please with Britain, but she is too wise to take old popery back again while Smithfield lasts and while there is one of the signs of martyrs there. Aye, while there breathes a man who marks himself a free man and swears by the constitution of old England, we cannot take popery back again. She may be rampant with her superstition and her priestcraft, but with one consent my hearers reply, we will not have popery. Then what will ye choose? Shall it be Mohammedanism? Will ye choose that with all its fables, its wickedness and sensuality? I will not tell you of it nor will I mention the accursed imposture of the West that has lately arisen. We will not allow polygamy while there are men to be found who love the social circle and cannot see it invaded. We would not wish, when God hath given to man one wife, that he should drag in twenty as the companions of that one. We cannot prefer Mormonism. We will not, and we shall not. Then what shall we have in the place of Christianity? Infidelity, you cry, do you, sirs? And would you have that? Then what would be the consequence? What do many of them promote? Communist views and the real disruption of all society as presently established. Would you desire reigns of terror here, as they had in France? Do you wish to see all societies shattered and men wandering like monster icebergs on the sea, dashing against each other and being at last utterly destroyed? God, save us from infidelity. What can you have then? Not. There is nothing to supplant Christianity. What religion shall overcome it? There is not one to be compared with it. If we tread the globe round and search from Britain to Japan, there shall be no religion found so just to God, so safe to man. We ask the enemy once more, Suppose a religion were to be found which would be preferable to the one we love. By what means would you crush ours? How would you get rid of the religion of Jesus? And how would you extinguish his name? Surely, sirs, you would never think of the old practice of persecution, would you? Would you once more try the efficacy of stakes and fires to burn out the name of Jesus? Would you try racks and thumbscrews? Would you give us the boots and instruments of torture? Try it, sirs and ye shall not quench Christianity. Each martyr dipping his finger in his blood would write its honors on the heavens as he died, and the very flame that mounted up to heaven would emblazon the skies with the name of Jesus. Persecution has been tried. Turn to the Alps. Let the valleys of Piedmont speak. Let Switzerland testify. Let France with its St. Bartholomew. Let England with all its massacres speak. And if ye have not crushed it yet, Shall ye hope to do it? Shall ye? Nay, a thousand are to be found, and ten thousand, if it were necessary, who are willing to march to the stake tomorrow. And when they are burned, if ye could take up their hearts, ye would see engraven upon each of them the name of Jesus. His name shall endure forever. For how can ye destroy our love to it? Ah, but ye say, we would try a gentler means than that. Well, what would ye attempt? Would ye invent a better religion? We bid you do it, and let us hear it. We have not yet so much as believed you capable of such a discovery. What then? Would ye wake up one that should deceive us and lead us astray? We bid you do it, for it, it is not possible to deceive the elect. You may deceive the multitude, but God's elect shall not be led astray. They have tried us. Have they not given us popery? Have they not assailed us with Puseyism? Are they not tempting us with Arminianism by the wholesale? And do we therefore renounce God's truth? No. We have taken this for our motto, and by it we will stand. The Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible, is still the religion of Protestants. And the selfsame truth which moved the lips of Chrysostom the old doctrine that ravished the heart of Augustine, the old faith which Athanasius declared, the good old doctrine that Calvin preached, is our gospel now, and God helping us, we will stand by it till we die. How will ye quench it? If ye wish to do it, where can ye find the means? It is not in your power. Ha, ha, we laugh you to scorn. But you will quench it, will you? You will try it, do you say? And do you hope you will accomplish your purpose? Yes, I know you will. 
when you have annihilated the sun, when you have quenched the moon with drops of your tears, when you have dried up the sea with your drinking, then shall ye do it, and yet ye say you will. And next I ask you, suppose you did, what would become of the world then? Ah, if I were eloquent tonight, I might perhaps tell you. If I could borrow the language of a Robert Hall, I might hang the world in mourning. I might make the sea a great chief mourner. With its dirge of howling winds and its wild death march of disordered waves, I might clothe all nature, not in robes of green, but in garments of somber blackness. I would bid hurricanes howl the solemn wailing, that death shriek of a world. For what would become us if we should lose the gospel? As for me, I tell you fairly, I would cry, Let me be gone. I would have no wish to be here without my Lord. And if the gospel be not true, I should bless God to annihilate me this instant. For I would not care to live if ye could destroy the name of Jesus Christ. But that would not be all that one man should be miserable, for there are thousands and thousands who can speak as I do. Again, what would become of civilization if you could take Christianity away? Where would be the hope of a perpetual peace? Where governments? Where your Sabbath schools? Where all your societies? Where everything that ameliorates the condition of man, reforms his manners, and moralizes his character? Where? Let the echo answer, where? They would be gone and not a scrap of them would be left. And where, O oh men, would be your hope of heaven? And where the knowledge of eternity? Where a help across the river death? Where a heaven? And where bliss everlasting? All were gone if his name did not endure forever. But we are sure of it. We know it. We affirm it. We declare it. We believe and ever will that his name shall endure forever, aye, forever. Let who will try to stop it. This is my first point. I shall have to speak with rather bated breath upon the second, although I feel so warm within as well as without that I would to God I could speak with all my strength as I might do. But secondly, as his religion so the honor of his name is to last forever. Voltaire said he lived in the twilight of Christianity. He meant a lie. He spoke the truth. He did live in its twilight. But it was the twilight before the morning, not the twilight of the evening, as he meant to say. For the morning comes when the light of the sun shall break upon us in its truest glory. The scorners have said that we should soon forget to honor Christ, and that one day no man should acknowledge him. Now we assert again in the words of my text, His name shall endure forever as to the honor of it. Yes, I will tell you how long it will endure. As long as on this earth there is a sinner who has been reclaimed by omnipotent grace, Christ's name shall endure. As long as there is a Mary ready to wash his feet with tears and wipe them with the hair of her head, as long as there breathes a chief of sinners who has washed himself in the fountain opened for sin and for uncleanness, as long as there exists a Christian who has put his faith in Jesus and found him his delight, his refuge, his stay, his shield, his song, and his joy, there will be no fear that Jesus' name will cease to be heard. We can never give up that name. We let the Unitarian take his gospel without a Godhead in it. We let him deny Jesus Christ. But as long as Christians, true Christians live, as long as we taste that the Lord is gracious, have manifestations of his love, sights of his face, whispers of his mercy, assurances of his affection, promises of his grace, hopes of his blessing, we cannot cease to honor his name. But if all these were gone, if we were to cease to sing his praise, would Jesus Christ's name be forgotten then? No. The stones would sing, the hills would be an orchestra, the mountains would skip like rams, and the little hills like lambs. For is he not their creator? And if these lips and the lips of all mortals were dumb at once, there are creatures enough in this wide world besides. Why, the sun would lead the chorus, the moon would play upon her silver harp and sweetly sing to her music, 
Stars would dance in their measured courses. The shoreless depths of ether would become the home of songs. And the void immensity would burst out into one great shout, Thou art the glorious Son of God. Great is thy majesty and infinite thy power. Can Christ's name be forgotten? No, it is painted on the skies, it is written on the floods. The winds whisper it, the tempests howl it, the seas chant it, the stars shine it, the beasts low it, the thunders proclaim it, earth shouts it, heaven echoes it. But if that were gone, if this great universe should all subside in God, just as a moment's foam subsides into the wave that bears it and is lost forever, would his name be forgotten then? No, turn your eyes up yonder and see heaven's terra firma. Who are these that are arrayed in white, and whence came they? These are they that came out of great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and praise him day and night in his temple. And if these were gone, if the last harp of the glorified had been touched with the last fingers, if the last praise of the saints had ceased, if the last hallelujah had echoed through the then deserted vaults of heaven, for they would be gloomy then, if the last immortal had been buried in his grave, if graves there might be for immortals, would his praise cease then? No, by heaven, no, for yonder stand the angels. They too sing his glory. To him the cherubim and seraphim do cry without ceasing when they mention his name in that thrice holy chorus, Holy, 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 Lord God of armies. But if these were perished, if angels had been swept away, if the wing of seraph ne'er flapped the ether, if the voice of the cherub never sung his flaming sonnet, if the living creatures ceased their everlasting chorus, if the measured symphonies of glory were extinct in silence, would his name then be lost? Ah, no, for as God upon the throne he sits, the everlasting one, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And if the universe were all annihilated, still would his name be heard, for the Father would hear it, and the Spirit would hear it, and deeply graven on immortal marble in the rocks of ages it would stand, Jesus, the Son of God, co-equal with the Father. His name shall endure forever. And so shall the power of his name. Do you inquire what this is? Let me tell you. Seest thou yonder thief hanging upon the cross? Behold the fiends at the foot thereof, with open mouths, charming themselves with the sweet thought that another soul shall give them meat in hell. Behold the death-bird fluttering his wings o'er the poor wretch's head. Vengeance passes by and stamps him for her own. Deep on his breast is written, A condemned sinner. On his brow is the clammy sweat, expressed from him by agony and death. Look in his heart. It is filthy with the crust of years of sin. The smoke of lust is hanging within in black festoons of darkness. His whole heart is hell condensed. Now look at him. He is dying. One foot seems to be in hell. The other hangs tottering in life, only kept by a nail. There is a power in Jesus' eye. That thief looks. He whispers, Lord, Remember me. Turn your eye again there. Do you see that thief? Where is the clammy sweat? It is there. Where is that horrid anguish? Is it not there? Positively there is a smile upon his lips. The fiends of hell, where are these? There are none, but a bright seraph is present, with his wings outspread and his hands ready to snatch that soul, now a precious jewel, and bear it aloft to the palace of the great king. Look within his heart. It is white with purity. Look at his breast. It is not written condemned, but justified. Look in the book of life. His name is graven there. Look on Jesus' heart. There on one of the precious stones he bears that poor thief's name. Yea, once more, look! Seest thou that bright one amid the glorified, clearer than the sun and fair as the moon? That is the thief! That is the power of Jesus! 
and that power shall endure forever. He who saved the thief can save the last man who shall ever live, for still there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. Oh, may I there, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, that precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. His powerful name shall endure forever. Nor is that all the power of his name. Let me take you to another scene, and ye shall witness somewhat else. There on that deathbed lies a saint. No gloom is on his brow, no terror on his face. Weakly but placidly he smiles. He groans, perhaps, but yet he sings. He sighs now and then, but oftener he shouts. Stand by him. My brother, what makes thee look in death's face with such joy? Jesus, he whispers. What makes thee so placid and so calm? The name of Jesus. See, he forgets everything. Ask him a question. He cannot answer it. He does not understand you. Still he smiles. His wife comes inquiring. Do you know my name? He answers, No. His dearest friend requests him to remember his intimacy. I know you not, he says. Whisper in his ear, Do you know the name of Jesus? And his eyes flash glory, and his face beams heaven, and his lips speak sonnets, and his heart bursts with eternity. For he hears the name of Jesus, and that name shall endure forever. He who landed one in heaven will land me there. Come on, death, I will mention Christ's name there. O oh, grave, this shall be my glory, the name of Jesus. Hell, dog, this shall be thy death, for the sting of death is extracted. Christ our Lord, his name shall endure forever. I had a hundred particulars to give you, but my voice fails, so I'd better stop. You will not require more of me tonight. You perceive the difficulty I feel in speaking each word. May God send it home to your souls. I am not particularly anxious about my own name, whether that shall endure forever or not, provided it is recorded in my master's book. George Whitfield, when asked whether he would found a denomination, said, No. Brother John Wesley may do as he pleases, but let my name perish. Let Christ's name last forever. Amen to that. Let my name perish, but let Christ's name last forever. Jesus, 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 crown him Lord of all. You will not hear me say anything else. These are my last words in Exeter Hall for this time. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Crown him Lord of all. This message, the eternal name, was preached by Charles Haddon Spurgeon on May the 27th, 1855. This is Charles Kelsch inviting you to join me again for another message from the Prince of Preachers.